So the time was the late 80s. It was lunchtime and a Friday, and it was dress down day. And so the two things I did on Friday was uh, wore jeans and a uh, t-shirt and uh, I usually took my Ferrari to work. A friend of mine who was a uh, policeman, detective, came up and asked me uh, would I like to go to lunch with him. And I said, uh, sure. And as we walked out the door here, I was walking over to my car. I thought maybe he'd ride with me. And uh, he goes, uh, I tell you what, I brought my car today. Uh, how about we race the lunch and the loser buys lunch? And I thought, OK, that's his, that's his way of uh, offering to buy me lunch, because I'm going to get in my Ferrari. So I don't know what he's racing me in. So I came up here, and I pulled up here, and as I stopped, here he uh, pulled up beside me. So we pulled out here in the street, right where I'm doing it right now. And it's a quarter mile to the uh, turn where we have to, <laughs> it just happens to be a perfect quarter mile. And uh, he pulls up here beside me and does a burnout and takes off. I took off here. But by the time I was here, he was nearly to the intersection. And I stayed into it, and the only, only way I almost caught him was I, I, I just stood on the brakes and I outbraked him. But he took off and shot down this little road right here. And uh, he was gone. At this point right here, if some TV game show said, ah, we'll give you a million dollars if you tell us what kind of car that was, I couldn't have told you what it was for my life. Sure is cold up here, isn't it, man? The 
December the 11th, 1987, was a very historic day in the automotive world. It was the day that the oldest plant that General Motors was operating that began in 1927 came to a close. And the last car off the assembly line was a 1987 Buick Grand National. On that final day, my wife and I have been, uh, our four-year-old son was there. You know, we, we set out with a uh, movie camera and we made sure that we filmed every bit of it as best we could. The most significant event uh, in the plant that day, without a doubt, was the uh, when it came time for the body drop. And at that point, that's when it becomes a car. That was when it became a Grand National. You know, there were people cheering, there was people clapping, there were people crying. These people were losing their jobs that day. But they, they wanted to see that last car through. I remember a um, lady came up to us and gave me a big hug. And she was crying. She said, you know, this car was built by the best. And I want you to take care of it. And I hope I've done just that. I hope I've taken care of that car. I own the last Buick Grand National built. I feel really privileged to have the car. We wanted this car since we had been a General Motors dealer for so many years. I felt like I should start a campaign to get the last car. And we started writing letters to uh, Buick top management six months earlier, making phone calls. I was so persistent about having the last car. And Buick finally agreed Yes, I wanted it from the, a collector standpoint. But you have to understand that I'm probably a little different from a lot of other car dealers. I have a real passion for General Motors, and I have a real passion for these cars. It becomes more than a car to me. And someone was going to get the last car. Someone who didn't even possibly know they were getting the last car. Might not have even been significant. But it is a, a part of automotive history that should be in a museum, should be put up, and should not be driven because of what it represents. We've had the car in its bedroom since 1990, preserved in its natural state. Grand National is uh, a very memorable Buick, particularly to car enthusiasts. And it had rather humble beginnings. Here was a, a car with a Buick uh, coat on, which is to say traditional American, very simple, mass-produced car. They were the hot version of 
a type of car that's called personal luxury cars. These are two-door, uh, sort of creased and folded shapes. And as far as what's underneath, they were body-on-frame construction, rear-wheel drive, not very sophisticated suspension or steering or braking equipment. And really the drive lines weren't very sophisticated either. But Buick had built an engine just using stock Buick parts, aided first with turbocharging, then turbocharging and intercooling. And this changed everything in the car. Skyhawk, Skylark, Buick Century, Buick Riviera, Buick Regal, La Sabre, Park Avenue. In the 80s, you know, your typical Buick was like, I don't want to call it an old people's car, but or, uh, I mean, they had a word grocery getter or grandma's car, or, <laughs> you know. I mean, it was, uh, it was more of a luxury type of vehicle. More of a, you know, a mom pop car. My father started in the car business selling cars Castle Buick in Berwyn, Illinois. We had a little more of an older clientele, uh, middle-aged to semi-retired or retired folks, you know, uh, traded their car in every year. When I started selling cars at 16 years old, I mean, the people would come in and, oh, you remind me of my grandson. <laughs> Buick went through a long period of, of trying to define what it really is. And they came up with four words, substantial, distinctive, powerful, and mature. Substantial, distinctive, powerful, and mature. Those were the four words that describe Buick. And then uh, overarching that, premium American motor cars. That was kind of the image. Buick uh, was kind of not able to get the excitement because excitement was a word that was reserved for Pontiac. At times, it seemed like we were trying to describe a, a new Buick as almost like a living room. It was uh, comfortable and safe and secure. Uh, those kinds of words were very much a part of the Buick lexicon, and they were trying to live up to those words up until Lloyd Royce came in and said, we've got to do something about lowering Buick's demographics. The Grand National came at a time when uh, Buick was flat on its back, and so it surprised a lot of people. I convinced Herb Fischel, who worked for me at Chevrolet when I was there, uh, and Herb ran uh, Chevrolet's performance division, I convinced Herb to come up to uh, Buick and start a performance division within Buick division, and he did that. Herb and his team uh, and design staff all work together. What kind of a vehicle could we put together that is a younger theme? Doesn't appeal to the doctor and demonstrates something radically different. 
Herm approached me, and one of the projects he asked me to work on were some sketches, some ideation about this concept car called a Grey National. Buick didn't really have any performance platforms as a starting place for the Grand National. So I had to kind of use what we had. And what we had was a Buick Real. That was about the only platform in the right size that would be appropriate. And I remember doing a three-car montage illustration of kind of three different directions yeah. that the car could take. This is really in its inception. Nobody knew what this was. One of them was uh, kind of a more of a typical studio approach. I had some stripes and that kind of thing on it. The other one was a uh, red car, all red, no chrome. I did have a thin black stripe on it. And the third one was black, and it's all blacked out. Design studios, they, you know, they loved it. The dealers love it, and they couldn't get enough of them. And I liked it, so, so all right, let's do that. The first time I saw a Grand National, I'll never forget it. I um, I was at the dealership. Walked out the door there to go get a stock number, and it was packed. We must have probably got two truckloads in that day of cars, and it was just packed. I mean, just almost bumper to bumper. And I saw this all black car. And I kind of looked and I walked up to it and all black. Blacked out trim. Sitting on Eagle GT tires, aluminum wheels. I saw a little tachometer and a boost gauge in there. 3.8 SFI turbo on the hood, little bubble in the hood. Saw Grand National on the side fender. I said, Grand National. I thought maybe it got dropped there and maybe it was a Chevrolet and it was just at the wrong store, needed to go down the road or maybe an Oldsmobile, you know. You didn't even know it was a Buick until you looked on the grill. Here we are. This was this was the whole corner. I had an old park, the Buick dealership is right here. It's Walgreens now. This is about right here where that Grand National is at. Like I say, I had no idea what I was looking at until I saw that fender and went and grabbed the keys and got in that car and started it up. It was like nothing I ever heard before. I mean, to this day, I mean, a Grand National still has that sound, or if somebody doesn't know about them, they'll, wow, that thing sounds different, you know. When I first saw it, I said, well, yeah, this is another pretender. You look at that vehicle and you see somebody trying to do something with it that it doesn't have any business doing. Without having driven it, just looking at it, just the, the paint scheme and the, the wheels and so on, it says, okay, somebody's trying to tart up a, a, a very mediocre pedestrian vehicle.
I had a lot of mixed feelings about the Grand National. The car is every man's family car. Holds four to five people, huge trunk. It's a grocery getter. It's a functional, functional bread and butter car for Buick. It was a, a uh, civilized car, a luxurious car, actually, you know, until you messed with it. No, I'm 40 years old. I've never got the car out of my system, and it's uh, it's incredible. To this day, I'm still that's that's my life. I put these out here because I got a front set out. I just in case guys want to see. I was so inspired by the car that I started a business. We sell and manufacture, you know, parts for these cars. Keep these cars alive. I mean, it's, to this day, I mean, there's, I don't think there's anything out there that I'd rather own. The Turbo B6 is the heart and soul of that, of that whole package. If it didn't have that engine, it would have never done anything. Nobody would have bought a black reel with chrome wheels. It just, nobody would have taken it seriously. But there's more to it than just appearance. There's something inside that car trying to get out, that it's, it's, it's trapped in the wrong body, so to speak. We got the Grand National. It appeared in the April issue of Car and Driver, 86, I guess it was. When we get test cars at the magazines, uh, we typically get a car for a road test for maybe two weeks. And uh, at the time, we were testing in Michigan through the winter. Uh, and here we are in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Our test track was the Chrysler Proving Grounds, about 20 miles down the road. So I took the car out to Chrysler. And, uh, you know, it's 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, you're trying to get the testing done before the sun goes down because it is January. And it was a super cold day. It was an eight degree day. The Regal had a little boost gauge, which was an instrument that measures how much pressure the turbocharger is putting into the engine. And it was an electronic one. It was a series of LEDs. And with a little experimentation, I discovered the technique for that day. I brake torqued it, floored the throttle, and as soon as the very first LED lit up, lifted my foot off the brake and off we went. And that was a perfect launch. And the tires somehow were hooked up unbelievably and they made not the squealing sound, it was almost a, it was like a harsher sound, almost like the tread was being ripped off the tires. At the time, there was actually a, a paper tape that would spit out the results, and I'm looking at this, and I'm just having a hard time believing this thing. 1985 or 86, at the time, anything six flat or under zero to 60 was really, really fast in those days. I mean, uh, there just weren't a lot of cars that quick. When I first saw this 4-9, my first reaction was, is, 
you know, this is impossible. There's no way this can go that fast. Although, while doing the test, I mean, the car felt quick. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. So uh, the reaction is amazement. And then the next thing is, well, can it do it again? And I did several of them. I mean, I did four, five, four, nine, zero to 60s. It might even have been a little bit quicker than four and nine, but we weather correct. And often the time improves. This time we would have been slowing it down. In the pure context of this zero to 60 number, the Grand National was up there with the fastest cars in the world, bar none, bar at, at any price. I mean, cars that cost, uh, you know, five, six, seven times as much as this Grand National, and it's right there with them. I mean, you wouldn't want to race them for pink slips. I remember. And I said, well, what you got under the hood? And Frankie actually, he said, oh, no, it's just got a six cylinder in it. And he popped the hood and I stood there and I counted spark plug wires and I counted one to six and then I counted back down from six to one and I counted from one to six. I couldn't get over the fact that it was a Buick, that it didn't look like a exotic sports car. And I mean, he bragged he had a turbo. And at that time, I really didn't even know what he was talking about. But it sure made an impression. And from that day on, I wanted me one. This shop was definitely not part of a plan. It just evolved. At first glance, you don't even realize how much stuff is here until you just start walking around trying to look at all of it. Some people see it and think it's absurdly crazy. Some people think they've gone to heaven when they see it. and. Uh, I guess everybody just has a different uh, way to evaluate what they see here. It's not unusual for somebody to come up for whatever business reason uh, that, that, that doesn't really even know what I'm doing here. And they see these cars and they're initially puzzled by it and they can't figure out, well, what's with all the black cars? And, of course, the first comment out of their mouth is, uh, oh, what are you doing with all those Monte Carlos? Because, you know, if, if they think they're a car person and they don't know what a Turbo Regal is, it's a Monte Carlo. Okay, and then, you know, I'm certainly quick to correct them there. No, it's not a Monte Carlo, it's a Grand National. Uh, and. To, the, to those that really understand what it is, uh, it's, it's an object of, of respect and, and they revere the cars. Uh, but to people that, are, that don't really understand what they are, uh, it's an oddity and they really don't 
see much value in it. They don't give it any respect. You know, it's just plain and simple. I love my cars. I love my cars like I love my dog. And uh, I don't uh, see it as, oh, gee, look at all this stuff. Uh, I see it as something that I can create something with. I can take an old, beat-up Grand National that, that somebody's raced the death and uh, you know, or, or, or wrecked or, or whatever shape it's in and and there's some kind of satisfaction that you achieve by uh, making it like it should have been or or fixing it where somebody neglected it. A lot of people were inclined to compare the speed available in these cars to, to everything. And in 87, there was no Ferrari that could run with it. There was no Lamborghini. In terms of acceleration, zero to 60 and quarter mile, uh, the only cars that could come close were uh, like a Porsche Turbo, That's a very elite group. The truly elite cars in the world, the Ferraris, the Lamborghinis, the Porsches and the like, they're elite because they've demonstrated superiority in a number of areas over a long period of time. I mean, all those cars, they kind of start with performance. They've all been high-performance cars for a long, long time. That performance aspect of their eliteness is also typically bolstered by some racing. And that gives their streetcar performance even more credential when there's a uh, genuine racing heritage backing it up. The cars often have been beautiful as well. And uh, Ferraris over the years, some of them were the most beautiful cars ever designed. So they're fast, they've got racing heritage, they're good looking. And over the years, then this builds up this uh, acceptance by not only automotive enthusiasts, but it gets to the point where even non-enthusiasts know that there's something special there. And of course, if they build great cars, the longer they build them, the more elite and the more solid their status becomes. The Grand National has this one area, uh, acceleration, where it is absolutely fabulous. And on every other front, it just doesn't figure. Uh, you know, it doesn't have the pedigree. It doesn't have the all-around excellence. It doesn't have uh, great styling. It doesn't have great materials. It, it never escaped its Americanness, is really the truth of it. And uh, that's why it became, uh, uh, was limited to being a muscle car and not much else. My car, my 85 Grand National, she's a trailer queen. Since I restored the car, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm gonna risk anything happening to it.
You know, I'd, I'd pull out of the driveway, or God forbid, rock hits a car, you know? It never gets driven around the block. It just goes on and off a trailer. The tires never touch the pavement. What makes it special is you'll, you're not going to find one out there like it. First of all, it's an 85, so they're rare to begin with. You know, the 86, 87, the production numbers are a lot higher. This car was limited to 2,000. Out of the 2,000, what makes it more rare is the T-tops. I restored the car from the ground up, and this car is floorless to 300%. There, you will not find one thing wrong with this car. I've always entered the car in the car shows ever since it was restored. I got about 30 trophies for the car, mostly first, some second. I've never left the show with, without a trophy. When I win a trophy, I walk away extremely happy. Um, not only for the fact that I won, but the fact that all my hard work, my love and dedication is, has paid off. It's like a pat on my back, saying I did a good job. People I talk to my friends and at work, they all tell me, yeah, I tell them I won. And like, well, did you get any money? I said, you know what, I don't want the money. I want the trophy because the money you'll blow on something and it's gone. The trophy will always be there showing that this car, it deserved the trophy for what it is. And then I always take a picture. I take a picture of my daughter with the trophy next to the car. I saw the car in a plastic bubble. And what it does, it just preserves the car. There's fresh air that it gets pumped through the, through the bubbles, which keeps it inflated. And it keeps all the moisture out. It keeps all the lint, all, all your rodents, anything that away from the car. So it, it can't get hurt. Sunday, September 27th, is uh, the last car show of the year. It's one of the biggest shows for English Town. Uh, they do it twice a year, spring and fall. There's a spring swap meet and a fall swap meet. I always go to the fall because the fall is being, it's always judged. The other ones are just people's choice. The negativity we get on the Grand Nationals are not that, not of the looks itself, but it's a Buick, which kind of pisses me off because so what's a Buick? I think beauty is undefinable. Like you go to the museum, look at the painting, and think that's you know beautiful, this and that, where I may not. Um, like, you'll take, take me with my Grand National. I think that's the most beautiful car in the world. Whereas uh, somebody else might just think it's just a car, or they may not like the car at all. To me, you know, my cars are a beautiful painting. They're a beautiful sculpture. Uh, in terms of how much it's actually worth, my car, um, to me, I can't put a price on it. To me, the car is priceless. It's a strange and curious misfit. It's the inheritance of the car. It's the genes that are in there to start with. Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and so on. These cars are born of 
decades and decades of world-class racing. The formal vocabulary among the very high-performance cars in Europe was a uh, very biomorphic school of design, very uh, bulbous, almost amoebic kinds of forms, very smooth, uh, silky, amoebic forms with undulating surfaces. But you also had these slivered, angular, planar surfaces. You know, I think of the Testa Rosa. And so it must have seemed kind of mystifying to the man on the street. Well, wait a minute. This Grand National is as fast as a Ferrari, but it, it doesn't, it's, 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 it's got the wrong suit of clothes on. You know, it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's a tennis champ in a tuxedo. Wait a minute, this is all wrong. How did it get this boxy body? 1960-61, Bill Mitchell, our vice president at that time, on trips to Europe, was sort of taken with Rolls Royces. They had a kind of an upright sort of a boxiness, a certain dignity, if you will, because the, the queen could walk in, almost walk into them and sit down. Mitchell loved it. He thought it was dignified, it was elegant, and so on. So in 1963, the Buick Riviera had come out with that look, this very, very boxy look. That then carried on, and into the 70s, it became endemic in General Motors cars. Even in the early 80s, this was still in the air. Well, the Regal got that. Its origins were for cruising around London at probably, what, 30 or 40 miles an hour in this tremendously dignified car that's probably a foot higher than the cars around it because it's meant for the queen to sit there in, 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 her, in great comfort. Uh, <laughs> and then suddenly you're putting this thing on, this on a race course? When you compare performance cars, it's not always apples to apples. It's hard to compare a functional or multifunctional car that was done within very strict parameters. To a car that is purpose-built for the ultimate sports car challenge and come up with a rational kind of end result. A Ferrari owner knows he's buying a car that is steeped in history. They have a, a, a rich history of racing and winning. What those cars are trying to be an automotive ultimate, okay? And Regal was not aimed at, it was to be a, a mainstream market car. What is amazing about it is that the car performs the way it does at one-tenth the cost of a Ferrari. And maybe that's what makes it so attractive, or the lovable aspect of the car. You know, that it was, well, maybe lowly parentage, yes. You know, look what you can do with that. Sunday morning, 27th, September, the day of the big show. 
Uh, it's about 9.30 in the morning. We should be at the track right now, setting up the display in the car, put the car on display. But unfortunately, uh, Mother Nature let me down. So, you know, my plan is just to enjoy the day off. I just, uh, you know, I took off for of work and everything. So, just use it as a day off and relax. You know, you have your hopes up to show the car. You know, you sit there, people come up to you. They say, you know, wow, what a beautiful car, this, that. And it really makes you feel all the love and attention you gave the car, all the, everything you did to get it to where it is just pays off. When people just sit there and just talk to you and just say, you look a real nice car you got. The show was rain or shine. I'm sure there's guys there, but mine ain't going. The fact that, that this car can, can go as fast from zero to 60 as some of the most celebrated and revered cars in the world um, doesn't really put it in the league of the most revered cars in the world. It's still an outsider. It's an outsider in the world of Porsches and Lambos and so on. It's an outsider in the world from, that spawned it, General Motors and Buick. And it is, I suppose, the quintessential outsider car. It really belongs nowhere, and it exists apparently on its own terms. A car has a certain lifespan, and a program has a lifespan, a model has a lifespan. There are formulas for coming up with when do you stop it, when do you start it. Sometimes a car should die. Rear-wheel drive was going away at General Motors. The only car scheduled to have it forever was the Corvette. There never was really plans to do a front-wheel drive Corvette. It didn't make any sense. It was a sports car. But Buick knew that the Grand National was gone, the G-Body was gone. Um, there would not be another performance Buick, not in the foreseeable future. So a bunch of guys got together and figured, we're gonna go front wheel drive. Hey, let's go out in style, let's go out in glory, let's go out standing up. The GNX. The ultimate Grand National. On October 9th of 1986, uh, Mike Doble put together a uh, package, a program review with uh, Buick Engineering, uh, talking about the goals of the 1987 GNX, the Grand National to end all Grand Nationals. I'm reading right from the document here. Objective, create a limited production Grand National that achieves a memorable place in the history of high performance automobiles one that car collectors will want to own and that automotive writers will never forget. My responsibilities in the GNX program was to, I think, find the right people and enable them to do the best job they could. I was advanced concept and specialty vehicle manager for Buick. And when I think of the GNX program, I can't help but smile. I was very fortunate. I had no management restrictions on me whatsoever. Granted limited volume, we had to do that. Granted, limited price, we had to do that as well. But speed and performance and sheer fun were not limited in any sort. And the direction just built us something uh, outstanding. We were going out celebrating the end of this G-Car line, building the perfect Grand National. 
It had all the refined treatments that the Grand National dreamed about when it went to bed at night. We made heavy modifications to those products. The only way we could do it was to bring in an outside source. It's just down another three quarters of a mile. Uh, this is uh, this right down the street here. This is the ASC, uh, used to be the ASC McLaren facility. This is where the Grand Nationals were converted into GNX. This is where the cars used to come in, that third door. The gates and everything have changed, but the building is still here. God, this brings back memories. At the time when the GNX program started, I was working at ASC. This is actually the, uh, the start of the assembly process when we were first getting started. Uh, the line is full. We're starting to uh, work on the cars. This next picture here is them. Uh, it, it shows uh, two people actually starting to put the, uh, the louvers, uh, the front fender louvers, in the vehicle. These next pictures show the uh, removal of the turbocharger and the installation of the GNX turbo. When the GNX turbo was put in, it was probably the most significant change uh, to the vehicle, especially to the performance. We did the rear suspension on the vehicle. That was uh, near the end. This next picture shows at the end of the assembly line. Is it a perfect car? By no means, no. No car is perfect, but I think this was the perfect realization of the Grand National. I always had a GNX in my press fleet, so I always drove one, I was familiar with one, and to be a good PR guy, you have to know about the product, so I learned about the product. The first time I drove one was my, my press fleet car, which was a very low number, 002 or 003. And I was up in Westchester County. I had the car for the weekend, and I was getting on an, uh, an entrance ramp onto one of the big highways going up to Westchester, and I saw traffic coming, and I just nailed it. And it just put me back in the seat, and the tack just went flying, and boost went up like instant. And I turned to my wife and I said, I think I just had a religious experience. It was seriously fast. When you were in it, that car was just eating up pavement. It would put you back in the seat, and the car would feel like it was flying. There aren't many cars that are described as axe-wielding barbarians, and that's how Tony Ascenza described the GNX after he drove the car I gave him. Well, I was, um, at the time that I wrote this, this article, I was on staff at Car and Driver, and one of the many things I did was 
not necessarily road test cars, that was done by the technical staff, but I wrote a lot of driving impressions of, of new cars. I said in the article that it would lay waste to anything in its path, and, and that was its, its role in life. It was a monster. You only got a taste of it once you actually put your foot real hard on the gas pedal. Once the turbo kicked in, it, it really was like leaping on the back of a crazed tiger. Uh, it was, there wasn't much to hold on to. Uh, you were along for the ride. I like this part. This talks a little bit about um, the legend of the GNX, and it has the famous video that was shot uh, in uh, March of 1987 uh, when uh, Tom Weber was uh, driving the GNX here against the twin turbo Callaway Vet, which was really the, the king of the hill at the time. The GNX uh, handily outpacing the, the uh, twin turbo. Corvette in four out of four runs. And what's interesting is that, uh, as uh, Tom Weber said, he had his wife and son in the car for one of the runs too, which makes it even more insulting to the Corvette because they had two passengers with them. And as they were coming through the traps, his wife said to him at the end of the run, his wife said, so why is the Corvette slowing down? And he said to her, the Corvette's not slowing down, we're pulling away from it. This just says it all to me. Paul Zazarin, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, he is an automotive writer. He has written many books, as well as contributed uh, to many of the automotive performance magazines. He's been around forever. And he said, nailing the throttle was a combination of being shot out of a cannon and getting launched off an aircraft carrier. I have never in my life seen a car that could accelerate so quickly. It was just unbelievable. Fortune of 547 vehicles was a very short run production, but it was a great production to have. I was very fortunate to, to work on the job. I was very fortunate to get to be uh, with the people that I, uh, I work with. It uh, was a great, great thing. with vehicles. Vehicles and trailers. In fact, that fence wasn't there. It was just full of vehicles. That's the small door I used to go into in the morning. All those years ago. When we were done, there was never a consideration to continue the build because the plant was shut down. All the tools were pulled out of the plant for the G-Body. There were no Grand Nationals or Regals to continue the build. It was gone. But we had meetings on this. We truly did. And we tried to say, what would we do next? What would we do differently? There was nothing. There literally was nothing. We didn't feel we shortchanged the customer, the car, or ourselves at all. So, you know, with the G-Body going away, there wasn't going to be another Grand National. Owners of the Grand National probably lamented the end of the line. But essentially, you know, it died a very happy death. It, it died it, it, it couldn't have had a better end to it. The car went out of circulation being the quickest car being built in America that year. So it made a defiant statement right to the end, and it said, end of story, we won.
When I look at a Buick Grand National on the street or in a show, I mean, it still turns my head. So there's something about that car. There's some magic about it. That's unique in history. And, and I don't know what it is. Some of it's the fact that it's a Buick. It shouldn't be a Buick, but it's a Buick. You have to understand, the Grand, the Grand National fit in between a muscle car era and the computer performance age, if I can coin it that. It, it, fit, it fit in there and, and it, it was, it hit a home run where nobody else could. Everything was downsized, we've got bumpers, we've got fuel restrictions, we've got emission issues and all that. And everybody's struggling. And the 80s was a real struggle. Late 70s, early 80s was a real struggle for performance cars. And Buick hit a home run with that, the turbocharged V6 was all the low-end torque and, and, and everything. And they emerged as a, as a winner in this vacuum of dull performance cars. And so it's not, it's, to me, it's not a tragedy. It's a victory. It's a tremendous victory. It runs. We're uh, getting the baby out for a walk. Or a cruise, I might say. After 25 years. See if it'll if the turbocharger would still spool up as a Grand National should. Yep. It feels good. I think it succeeded in its ambitions far beyond what Buick had anticipated. The fact that there are all these clubs that people are still hugely passionate about it. I'm being interviewed about it 20 some odd years after the fact. Uh, it clearly made its mark. I mean, the fact that this product has inspired so many people to spend money and energy and invest their emotions in it, has, has got to make it a winner. We're here in Burlington, North Carolina for the first ever TurboBuick.com Nationals. And what we've done is we've combined the drag racing at Piedmont Dragway along with a technical session here at Richard Clark's place. He had graciously allowed TurboBuick.com the access to his facility. Uh, you've got two buildings here, one of them 60 by 80, the other one's 80 by 120, and they're full of stuff. It's just amazing to the eye. As far as in Buick land, you'll never find a larger collection. You'll never find as much knowledge or anything you'll ever see than here in Burlington at Richard Clark's facility. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. This is one of a kind type of uh, individual to collect like this, to be so focused and develop the, uh, the resources to bring it in and organize it, and, but the volume, I mean, the volume is, never seen anything like it. I've been around a lot of car people. <laughs> 
in this area. He's renowned. Right? Renowned, yeah. <laughs> if anybody says Grand National, they say, oh, Richard Clark. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Richard Clark is someone that just keeps the fire going. He is the, I would put him as the premier Buick guy just for the fact of his love for the cars, his passion for the cars, and his generosity where he gives back and everything. And I think that's what keeps a lot of the Buick guys together. It's trying to start with full pressure. Well, the average person sees me as sort of like an extremist. It's rather extreme, I, even I have to admit it, okay? But I'm fortunate that I, I, I have the means to do what I like. Everybody tighten up. To see all these people show up and uh, the place be elbow to elbow in here and everybody having a good time. Got it. Everybody good? I don't know. It's, it's overwhelming. It really is. I, you know, I, I, everybody comes up, thanks me, and it's like, you know, I didn't get involved to get anything out of the event. I just enjoy sharing a good thing with, with good people. club's only going to be so big, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a group of people, we're in a club that uh, we know can never be great big, because there's not enough of it to go around. printing more money every day, but they're not making any more of these. And uh, when they're all gone, they're all gone. But I think the kind of people that are here uh, will keep it alive.